Welcome back to our second part of our Alien Resurrection series. If you haven't seen part one, we suggest you do that first. Otherwise, let's continue. The second draft of the Alien Resurrection script, dated July 22, 1996, was technically the last written script for the Alien film, with only slight refinements, excluding some ending details. This is the breakdown of the things that were different from the final product. The first shot is of the bug alien that is squashed and spit through a straw at the audience. It then proceeds just like the theatrical cut. There are still dream sequences with Ripley and bugs in a wheat field, like the first draft and another dream where Ripley rips at her chest to get at something. When Perez debates with the scientists about terminating Ripley, he is still using normal code terminals to get in the door that requires his handprint to enter. In this version, as the Betty approaches, Elgin goes to the engine room where Vries tells him the engine is barely getting by. Elgin asks if the ship can get them out of the territories, and Vries says if they can get some parts at their next stop, maybe. Thus, there is dire need for Elgin to mention this to the general later. This also explains why Elgin specifically says to Christy, yeah, we'll do till we get the family wagon up to spec, I reckon. Yeah. Everything continues on, and the dream scene where Ripley kills Gediman with inner jaws still remains in the script. During the showdown with the crew of the Betty, everyone is taken out like the earlier script. There is no bouncing bullets as seen in the film. The aliens get loose, as before, and soldiers are killed. One is covered in acid from above after killing an alien, and the barracks is invaded like earlier drafts. In this draft, Ripley escapes her cell like the film, rather than going through the ceiling. Perez also dies, just like the earlier draft, and is sucked through a hole in the hull. An alien still falls from above, killing Elgin by biting through his chest, and dropping him by an acid hole. Everyone scatters, firing at the beast, missing, and then the creature slowly steps after them, and Ripley shows up by using Elgin's body like the film. The creature falls, she approaches the crew, but the alien then gets back up, not completely killed. Call says, shoot it, shoot them both. The alien tries to bite Ripley, but she grabs its inner jaw and tears it out, killing it. She then gives Call the souvenir, and Ren states there are 30 aliens in total on the ship. In this version, during the elevator discussion with Vries, Ripley states there will be more aliens. It is asked how long, and Ripley says, hours. Ren states, or less. The process has accelerated. It had something to do with cloned cells. Scenes continue as the previous draft, with them avoiding soldiers, fighting aliens, and trying to trap aliens by cryo-freezing them. After the clone room, with the Ripleys 1 through 7, they are about to enter the underwater kitchen. Ripley feels her mouth, and she is bothered. After Call asks what's wrong, Ripley says she lost a tooth, but suddenly it's growing back fast, which perplexes Ripley. The trap with the aliens still occurs, and the team rain bullets on the egg room like the first draft. The elevator shaft occurs like the first draft, except this time when Christy gets acid on him, the alien grabs him and hangs on. In an effort to keep Vries from dying with him, Christy cuts himself loose and falls with the alien hanging on to him. Call saves them by the elevator, and Ripley shoots the cable like the earlier draft, causing the alien beneath to fall to its doom. Call is confronted by the team, and Vries reveals that Call's blood is iodized magnetic mercury. Call's voice is also malfunctioning in this draft. In this version, the biodome with crops is completely omitted. The Betty team instead arrives at an area with alien resin signaling that they are near the hive. In this version, Call reveals she is going to crash the Origa, and Joner gives Call attitude until Ripley grabs his tongue, like the movie, asking if Call wants another souvenir. They then run, and Ripley falls into the Viper Pit. In this version, it describes this area as many alien bodies and Ripley seems to sink below the alien bodies, rather than it being a pulsating landscape 
we see in the film. When the newborn is born, it is different. Instead of being spider-like, it is more human. It still is queen-size with bone-white skin, red veins, and an alien dome for its head. It is noted as having huge hind legs. The newborn kills the queen, and then the soldier that screamed in the first draft, reaching for his rifle, is killed. After sucking him of all his blood, the newborn goes after Gediman. It then goes to Ripley, and it licks her. Then it frees her from some of her webbing, so it can wrap its arms around her. Ripley is shaking in terror, then it rubs against her, and a shaft sticks out of its belly, dripping towards her. The creature wants to have sex with Ripley. Ripley panics, falls into the pool below, and rises out of it with a weapon the soldier was reaching for when he saw the newborn, and she opens fire and escapes through a passage the newborn can't fit into. Thankfully, the sex scene that Weaver wanted since the mid-1980s did not happen. At the Betty, Purvis dies with Wren, and Call kills the chest burster with her stiletto. Ripley is let in the Betty while the newborn is on the roof. Ripley sits next to the surviving De Stefano, who did not die like the first draft by a stray bullet. The Betty barely escapes the Ariga as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. The ship is malfunctioning, and it flies over Paris, which has a new Eiffel Tower. The ship then comes down to a scrap metal junkyard, and the remains of the old Eiffel Tower is there. When the crew exit the craft, there are homeless people who live in the junkyard, which are comprised of men, women, and children. They are alarmed, and Joner tells them in French they are no threat to them. The crowd scatters as the newborn comes out of the shadow of the Betty's hull. Two of the homeless fire outdated guns at the monster, and the crew go for cover due to the inexperienced fire of the citizens. Ripley attacks the newborn, but the creature uses De Stefano as a shield and he dies. The newborn laughs. The newborn then heads after civilians and licks its lips, still laughing, when it sees children and an old lady. Call intervenes and is bit violently on the shoulder by the newborn, who thinks she is food and it gags on her blue android blood. It drops her as Ripley shoots the newborn in the belly. Ripley tackles the newborn and they fall through a massive pile of metal parts. Ripley's leg breaks and the newborn is limping towards her. Ripley manages to drag herself under debris while the newborn tries to dig for her. Call yells to Joner for help and the alien continues to go after Ripley. Then Ripley seems cornered, and the newborn reaches for her, but suddenly a magnetic lift appears, and it is turned on. The blood the newborn swallowed from Call and the remnants of the fluid on its mouth pull the creature six feet, and it slams into the magnet. Unfortunately, the creature grabbed onto Ripley, so she follows the beast as it is pinned both mouth and gut to the magnetic lift. As the crane moves, more metal debris fly towards the magnet, pelting both Ripley and the creature. Ripley manages to get free of the creature's grip, and she falls 30 feet as the magnet swings towards a compactor. When over the compactor, the newborn falls into it, and Vries turns it on. The creature is being crushed, but it manages to burst through a side with an arm flailing and its bloody face screaming. Then, Ripley, limping, stabs the creature through the head with a pole. Like the first draft, the crew muse on what to do, and it ends with Ripley and Call looking over the city. Ripley states the same line that she is a stranger to Earth herself, and the film ends. With the second draft done, Jean-Pierre kept meddling with ideas. He suggested that Wren be a woman villain, and 20th Century Fox Marketing said no because it was already a female-led film and felt they didn't need more. Genet also wanted to change established alien designs. He wanted the alien eggs to look alive and more animated than previous films. In initial discussions, alien warriors were changed to be more brownish, and it was stated in a 2019 panel that the alien's biomechanical traits were softened. In later interviews, it was said that nine alien suits were made for principal photography. However, in 1997, in the official making of Alien Resurrection book, Tom Woodruff stated, There are different types of warrior aliens. We have five suits. 
because there is a scene in which there are at least three aliens in a shot. Cinematographer Darius Kanji wanted the aliens to be really slimy so they could be more reflective for shots. The dynamics team obliged him. H.R. Giger was involved in newborn designs, but he got no credit when the film came out. He sent a strong-worded letter to Fox Studios as a result, and in later formats of the film, he was credited. As the newborn evolved, Genet suggested making the newborn more human, but it was feared that it would be too reminiscent of Species, which was just released in 1995. Stupidly, Genet was insistent that the hybrid have its genitalia very visual. It's stunning that this concept got into the sculpting phase because common sense would make it clear this was an American film, not a French one. Taste or preference has nothing to do with me saying this because anyone with practical judgment would know the MPAA would have given this film an NC-17 rating for this concept alone without hesitation. Fox was also against the idea, but they gave Genet creative control and Sigourney wasn't opposed to the idea as she was part of pushing a more sexualized theme in the movie. By the end of shooting, all scenes with the newborn had to be digitally modified to cover up the beast's privates for an R rating, thus wasting more time and money. It was, from start to finish, a fiscally brain-dead move without any foresight on the filmmaker's part. Now, one of Pierre's pet peeves was to match the camera setups for modern-day movies. He would count the shots and log them, and the truth is, this was counterproductive, as the number of shots do not make a successful film or define quality. As Pierre's team worked on art and storyboards, the 70 million budget had to be adjusted for each new idea, and as a result, earlier scenes began to disappear. This put Whedon in a bad spot because the more Genet tinkered with things like a mosquito evaporating after stinging Ripley, or a bug alien at the beginning, or brain gag effects for a kill, pulsating living eggs, and breathing monitors, the expense kept rising, and the more stuff Genet added, the smaller set pieces had to become. Thus, Whedon's ending got smaller and smaller. Whedon had a passion to send the film to Earth, and made two more smaller endings in hopes to achieve an Earth arrival. One was in a maternity ward, and there are very little details about that. There was also an ending in a desert, which would have been much cheaper to film. But in no time, Earth was out the window due to budget constraints. On a side note, one ending that was talked about, just after the second draft was finished, was to have the Betty crash into the Eiffel Tower. But it was never put to page. And then finally, they said, you know, we just don't think we need to go to Earth, so I just gave them dialogue and stuff. But I don't remember writing a withered, granny-looking, pumpkin-head kind of thing makes out with Ripley. Pretty sure that stage direction never existed in any of my drafts. Later... Genet would joke about the script changes he made to Joss's work. Too bad, Joss Whedon. At the time, Amalgamated Dynamics was testing the death of Perez, and it was worried that the film would not get an R rating with such a gruesome human death. You can see some of the original test footage above, and Genet devised swapping Hidea's original death with the newborn, and since it was an alien dying, they could push the limits, as the censors would not be so strict with a monster's death. However, there is another conflicting take on this. In a 2019 Q&A session, it was stated that the death of the newborn was changed because Titanic was over budget and running behind, so as a result, Fox wanted to change the death of the newborn and keep it on the established Betty set to save money. Which take is true is up for debate. To Jean-Pierre's surprise, Sigourney Weaver wanted him to hire Dominique Pinon for the film as Vries. This was not a problem for him, as Dominique was his favorite reoccurring actor in his movies, and he intended to hire him anyways. When Genet called him, Dominique thought his director friend was joking 
working. And then Sigourney got on the phone to convince him it was no joke. With Janae and his team entrenched, the most logical hurdle was that Janae did not speak English and much of his crew didn't. Luckily, Weaver and a few of the cast spoke French and this helped. Despite this, interpreters had to be hired and paid for the next year and that went on the production budget. Janae had this to say about it. Everybody spoke English except me. When I saw it on DVD, at the end I understood the story. I thought, oh, it's pretty good. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. I want to say something right now, but I'm going to just keep moving on and not comment at this quote until we cover the movie itself in later episodes. To help limit the translation issues, Janae focused on his storyboard script, which was basically a visual Bible of the written script. This way, if actors or crew had questions, he could show them the scene so they could visualize what he was trying to achieve in a shot. Janae's attitude was that if he got the shots in the Bible right, everything would fall into place and it would be the movie he wanted. This was Brad Dorif's take on the storyboard Bible. Nobody got a script. We got, um, you basically see drawings of the frames. And um, that was strange. This Bible would be finished on October 7th, 1996 and many of these storyboards I used to describe the earlier scripts so you could see it mostly in full. The evolution of these storyboards began to show Genet's changes to Whedon's concepts. We already know that Genet's first influence of the script was the bug alien opening but here are some of the other story changes that the storyboards show. The first change is a really neat idea which had a mosquito sequence where Ripley wakes up in her cell for the first time and a bug sucks her blood, and then it is consumed by her acid. Ripley then blows the ashes of the dead bug away. Genet was the one who wanted the breath consoles to get into doors. Genet was specifically the one to introduce the cube concept for alcohol rather than it being in liquid form. Also new was Call having a stack of breath keys on her person to access the nasty breathing panels. Genet was the one who wanted bullets bouncing off walls to kill the soldier during the Betty Crew confrontation. The idea was originally intended for a scene in City of Lost Children, but it didn't happen, and he wanted it in this film. In these storyboards, no guard would go into the holding pen with Gediman as backup. Instead, he went in by himself. Instead of the practical montage of aliens attacking and overrunning the military personnel on the ship, which would have been welcome, the scene where the soldier is frozen by the alien using its tongue to initiate the device, rather than its hand, was selected as the vital shot to show aliens taking over the ship. One of the better choices of these storyboards is having Vree seeing the alien and building his gun then shooting at it, rather than driving away from the creature fast and closing a door before it could get to him. Instead of the better premise where an alien kills Elgin by jumping on him from above with all the crew present, they decide to make his character stupid. By leaving his post at the end of his group and leaving their rear unguarded to collect guns in a dark corridor. So in this version he is pulled through the floor and killed conveniently, forcing his crew to be in more danger to find him. This version also has Christie's grenade launcher having the magnificent ability to bounce grenade shells off metal rather than explode on contact. The logic behind this idea is that the range for said weapon can be adjusted. A nice change was to have an alien following the team into the trapped area. Joner would shoot a power cable and it would fall into the water electrocuting the alien. Earlier versions had him using a burner. Then, Call resuscitates De Stefano, who lost consciousness in the water. To wrap up the casting in early November, J.E. Freeman was cast two weeks before filming. The last to be cast for the film was Michael Wincott as Elgin. Principal photography began on November 19, 1996 at the Fox Sound Stages. What was efficient about this film was that on the first day of shooting, editing began as well. Finished film would go straight to the editing room to be sorted out and worked on. There would be no editing and story chaos like there was with Alien 3. At the beginning of the shoot, Weaver was originally to have a leather costume for Ripley 8 that looked like the Xenomorph hide, but Weaver rejected 
rejected it. Costume designer Bob Ringwood refashioned the outfit for Kim Flowers, and when Weaver arrived on the set, she saw Kim in the outfit and changed her mind. As a result, Kim was not seen in most of the underwater scenes and could not be filmed. Ringwood had 12 hours to resize the outfit for Weaver, and Kim waited around and got Weaver's costume instead. The underwater scenes took three weeks to film. It was filmed on stage 16 and held 500,000 gallons of water, which took six days to fill. Winona had almost drowned when she was 12 years old and had to be resuscitated after the event. She could not get out of doing this because her hair was too short and her face was too visible. After suffering a complete anxiety attack on day one, she mustered up the courage to face this fear. Pearlman was not as lucky. He banged his head on a ceiling while trying to get to the surface and he was knocked out. Nearby crewmen saw him do this and quickly got him to the surface where he was resuscitated. After working with Weaver for a couple of weeks, Janae quickly learned his place around Sigourney. He stated one time he was directing her, he said, try to act like this. Sigourney would retort to her director by saying, no Jean-Pierre, I'm going to act like this. Then Sigourney did as she desired. In no time, Jean-Pierre did whatever Weaver wanted, and this included making changes in the script for her. In return, it was stated Sigourney made the shoot easy for him. She showed me, and I thought, okay, I have to follow her. Winona also did this to Janae sometimes. When he would get excited or frustrated with a shot and try to direct her, Winona would say, Jean-Pierre, take it easy, I'm gonna improvise. Jean-Pierre would often concede and in editing, things worked out. Since Ron Perlman was cast from the start, the studio was dubious of the idea. They thought he didn't fit the part of Jonah at all. However, when they watched the first dailies, they quickly reversed their attitude and stated he was perfect for the part. And he was. To Janae's credit, a lot of outlets covering Alien Resurrection often talk about the basketball shot as if it's the most interesting thing about the behind the scenes of this film, so I won't spend much time on it. Basically, Sigourney wanted to do that shot, and Jean-Pierre believed it would take 200 times to get the scene right. He wanted to just drop a ball from above and use digital trickery. When filming started on take six, she sunk the shot, and this was the original reaction from that take. Luckily, the editors could work around the stunned reactions. As filming went on, Jean-Pierre began to learn some English, and his favorite lines to use when directing was, faster much faster, and shut the fuck up. As filming went on, Janae became flustered when producers kept telling him to go faster. However, Sigourney Weaver advised Janae, don't worry about the money. What you do will be on the print for eternity. In March 1997, production was falling behind schedule. There were a lot of films in production at Fox at the time, and it put a lot of pressure on studio execs to hurry productions. Proactively, Sigourney Weaver and Winona Ryder had meetings with Fox chairman Bill Mechanic to ensure the studio would not try to cut scenes and rush the filming unnecessarily. The irony was that Jean-Pierre was no part of these meetings. Another thing to note is that the botanical gardens of the earlier scripts were never filmed. There is a fan-made picture out there, but this set was never realized due to budgeting. Sometime during production, a gas suddenly spread throughout the set, sending 19 crew members to the hospital. A few weeks later, the liquid nitrogen used to give Alien 4 its otherworldly look, and the heat of the set made Weaver pass out. Despite these events, the shoot was relatively calm and without incident. Main filming ended on April 24, 1997. At the end of principal photography, money was getting tighter and tighter, and scenes began to change. One of the first things to go was the unnecessary bug scene at the beginning of the film. A line producer asked Janae to change this concept, and he stated he was relieved the scene was going because he rightfully realized it was too humorous a tone to begin the movie on. Around March or April 1997, composer John Frizzell was hired to do the score for Alien Resurrection. 
He had previously done Dante's Peak and several smaller films. Genet wanted the score to have an erotic and romantic undertone, and Frizzell had plenty of time to flesh out the score, as he was given seven months to do it, which was rare for composers. At the end of production, the overall budget ended up being $70 million. Fox was sure this film would do gangbusters at the box office. And as we have stated before, Whedon later said they did everything wrong that they could possibly do. He stated they didn't change his vision, but they executed it horribly. Whedon's take has caused a healthy debate about this film over the years, and there are many out there who either love or hate this film. Whatever side you stand on, we hope that you will take part in our next video where we explore the film itself. For those who adore this film, don't worry. We won't be as harsh as Siskel and Ebert was voting this film one of the worst of 1997. Ouch. But in Alien Resurrection, the characters are unfocused, the plot is piecemeal, and the monsters are putting on the same old Boy, act. Boy, it wore me out very quickly. Yeah. And the premise, Roger, the convoluted story, I mean, uh, of setting this up. I mean, I'm lost in 15 minutes. I'm glad you explained it. Now I figured out what was going on. If you like what you see here, click like and subscribe. And if you really like what you see, send a super thanks.